right at the beginning of the program, I said that something happening in a far-flung place, um, <laughs> you're fooling yourself if you think, oh, it doesn't affect me here, I'm fine. It reverberates around the planet in many different ways. It could be amongst your colleagues or your friends or yourself or your, you know, in a thousand different ways. Uh, joining me now is somebody, as you, if you watch or listen to this show, you know, is is a, a very prized guest of mine. And I always, uh, I don't underestimate how, how lucky we are to have him contribute. Uh, Sam Vatnin um, uh, joins me now. Um, Sam, as a, a psychologist with a brilliant worldview, um, as, as someone who's, you know, as Jewish yourself, but I, I love the way that you look at, at the world through your eyes. And I think I just touched upon, you know, and I've touched upon it throughout the program. This whole thing of, ah, that's just the news, it's got nothing to do with me. And forgetting it impacts you know, very, very deeply for many people um, and in, in all sorts of ways for the rest of us. And I did that. One of the things that I wanted to do throughout today's show and why I'm so glad that we've got you is to just alert people to that so they don't blunder into it. It just taught me through. For, for, let's start with Jewish people as well, you know, and the way people think they're just one lot of people who all believe the same thing. I mean, you know, um, and and this is, you know, and the us and them thing. But, you know, also it's the Jewish New Year uh, as well. And there's a whole lot of feelings going on at the moment, isn't there? Yes. Shana Tova, Trisha, which yes, means in yeah. Hebrew, a happy new year. Um, the Jewish people is accustomed to ups and downs and uh, persecution and exile and warfare. Jews have been warriors throughout the ages, actually, well into uh, well into the time of Jesus Christ. And then they've been exiled by the Romans, and they became immigrants. The first mm -hmm. anti-immigrant movement in the world is anti-Semitism, because Jews have become mm -hmm. immigrants in in dozens of countries and territories and. And they have been uh, rejected by the hosts or the, the would be hosts. And so they have learned, they have learned to assimilate the, the outside point of view. And they reacted to it in a variety of ways. They tried to assimilate. They tried to isolate themselves. They became avoidant. They tried to, to have a state of their own, normalize themselves so that if they become normal, they would be accepted. It's all about being accepted. The Jews yearn for acceptance. And yet it keeps eluding them. And so in Israel, which is a fascinating experiment in its own right, in Israel, the population reacted, the Jewish population, reacted in, in two ways, denial and fantasy. Denial means that the Israelis pretended, lied to themselves, that the occupation is something they can manage and handle, would not corrupt them, would not undermine the very foundations of the Jewish state as a just and democratic state. So there's, a, there's been a lot of denial going on there. And another part of the, of the nation engaged in fantasy, the fantasy that, you know, at the flick of a button, there could be peace and coexistence, and everyone would be smiling and happy and so on and so forth, ignoring 140 years of strife, mutual massacres, and worse. Yeah. On October 7th, October 7th was a wake-up call for both sides of the equation, for the denialists and for the fantasies. The fantasies have learned that there is um, an accumulation of rage, resentment, yeah. Uh, on the Palestinian side, much of it justified, I must say. And the denialists have learned the limitations of power as a tool for managing one's affairs and one's relationships and guaranteeing one's future. What has been taken away from the Israeli nation on October 7th was, this, was a sense of safety. Now no one feels safe, not Palestinians, not Israelis, not Lebanese. Not, I think, even Iranians. 
And you're right that if, if anyone is deluding himself that this is a limited regional skirmish, then, you know, that's entirely untrue. This could easily spill over into uh, horrendous scenarios, which, you know. And so yeah. it's a trauma. It's a trauma to everyone involved. And the thing is this, our predecessors have been exposed to news about traumatic events. But in a lifetime, you would have been exposed to two or three such news. Mm. And mm. today, since the age of television, we are inundated with traumatic and traumatizing images, inundated. We're easily exposed daily to hundreds of images and bits of information which would have utterly destabilized and traumatized our ancestors. <laughs> and that's daily. Yeah. So we react in one of two ways. We become desensitized. There is compassion fatigue. We no longer care. We, we convert the whole thing into a kind of video game. Yeah. And the other type of reaction is we, be we become activists and we, we try to make the world a better place. And then we come we come across our own limitations and the very fact that power resides in the hands of the very few elites, yes. oligarchs, politicians, and so on and so forth. And that actually the simple folk, simple men and women, they have this, there's very little you can do and that in itself is traumatizing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Sir Keir Starmer said, he wrote a piece in, in um, the Times and he made the point of uh, there's a very rea real um, you know, risk, and I think it's probably already happened because we talked about discrimination in the workplace going up for Jewish and Muslim people, etc., is that people use use whatever trauma is happening, uh, they feel it's their time to shine, to 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 um, be anti, to be, you know, uh, finally I can hate out in the open uh, if I couch it in the right language. And that brings any um, anything happening anywhere in the world to our very doorsteps, doesn't it? Because it can be our colleague, the person up the road, the person in the next town who decides to enact, um, you know, I, I'm free to be hateful and you represent the people I want to be hateful towards. What traumatic events, even far away traumatic events, the very exposure to traumatic images, traumatic imagery, traumatic so sounds, traumatic traumatizing interviews and so on. What trauma does, even vicariously, even by proxy, even remotely, what trauma does, it takes away your belief in the essential goodness of people. And it takes away your belief that the world is a just, structured, an orderly place, not a hostile and indifferent one. Mm -hmm. So then you sit back and those are unconscious processes. And you say, well, people are not essentially good, they're essentially evil. And the world is an unsafe place, unpredictable, capricious, arbitrary, dangerous, full of risks lurking in, you know, in the woods. And so if you combine these two beliefs that people are malevolent, evil, conspiring, self-interested, narcissistic perhaps, psychopathic maybe, and that the world is a place of peril and menace. If you combine these two, this triggers in you a survival, the survival instinct. You, you want to fight yeah. back. And so now the next question is, who is the enemy? You need to identify an enemy to restore your sense of safety to restore some semblance of order and structure and justice into a universe that has been challenged by, by those traumatizing events. So you seek, you, you seek, you, you are looking for a, an abuser, an, an enemy, a, a foe. And then anyone would do. Anyone would yeah. do. Your neighbor, your neighbor might become an enemy. A, a core religionist might become an enemy. I mean, anyone would do. And then at that stage, you externalize aggression you you try to eliminate the this the perceived source of threat what i'm trying to say is that trauma triggers a chain reaction which is highly predictable has been has been described in literature time and again is 
ineluctable, in other words, there's no alternative, the chain reaction is one and only, and it leads inexorably from exposure to trauma to traumatizing others. What we yes. do, what we do, we project the trauma. We we have been traumatized, so we want to traumatize others. By traumatizing yeah. others, we regain control and mastery over a life that seemed for a while to be random and terrifying and, and so on. So yeah. hatred, hatred, envy, yeah. and rage, they are ways of asserting or reasserting control over an environment that is perceived to be out of control. It's, it's a sad note to end on, but Sam, you know, I, I think, I hope people listen, have listened to what you've said um, and, and recognize that within themselves, because the one thing we do have some control about is what we do with our feelings and not, as Sam, so, Sam you so brilliantly said, that we don't take our trauma and visit uh, it upon somebody else instead of dealing it with it ourselves. That's Sam Vatnin there, as I said, very, I love having him on the show. Uh, that's it for today. Let me say a quick thank you to Isla Lones, Carla Battisti, Jack Thrubben, uh, Faith Eden, Cami Lamont Brown, uh, because next up is uh, Mark Saggers, a wonderful Saturday, Sunday night. I'm getting my days right <laughs> with Mark Saggers. Mark, <clears throat> got a couple of minutes to tell me what's coming up. I'm sorry I've eaten into the hand over, but you know, no worries uh, it's at all. An no, no, don't worry about that. Um, should any further things happen, of course, in the Middle East, we'll be bringing you the very latest news on all of